Greetings one and all, and welcome to Beyond the Walls, uh, a global ministry of Center Place and Community of Christ in Canada. Before our Easter series focus, um, we had followed Jesus in the sacred story through the beginning of his ministry. His baptism, his introspective discernment spent in the wilderness, his calling of disciples. With this foundation laid, Jesus begins to share teachings which are presented not as a list of commandments to be obeyed without question, but as ideas designed to provoke thoughtful discernment in his disciples. Back in February, um, we considered these first teachings, the Beatitudes, and then the challenge that we uh, love not only God, neighbor, and self, but also our enemies. All these sayings were gathered by the author of Matthew into a collection that we've traditionally labeled the Sermon on the Mount. We will dwell um, on sayings from this collection this week and for the next month and a half. After which, our summer parable series begins. So, how do we, as Christ's disciples, in this day and age, enter into dialogue with Jesus? How are we to study, interpret, apply, and live his teachings responsibly? We talk about discernment, but what do we mean by it? How do we go about discerning? How can the insights gained through this spiritual practice be shared in sacred community so that a common consensus is achieved without sacrificing our diversity or compromising the worth of each individual? So I would like us to, uh, I would like to invite us to consider these and other questions today as we walk upon the disciples' path together. Our call to worship is taken from the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, Jesus advises, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. But the gate is narrow and the road is hard that, reads to, that leads to life, and there are few who find it. As we seek to embark on that hard road, let us share our opening hymn together. We are companions on the journey.
Let us pray. Creator God, in the beginning, you set two paths for us to walk. You established two gates within our soul. One is wide and opens to the easy and alluring path. The other one is narrow and opens to the hard path. So narrow this path is that we often miss it. We forget it is there. In the garden, you created us in your likeness, the gift of discernment you gave us. You gave us the freedom to choose because there is no love and joy without wisdom. We confess, O oh God, that we often feel conflicted because there is a way that seems to be right but in the end, it is the way to suffering. Beloved God, you came to live among us to face the same temptations that seduce us, to feel pain the way we do. Yet we acknowledge our beloved that on the cross you revealed to us the narrow gate because only the way of the cross leads to the glory of the resurrection. Grant us your wisdom that we too may find and choose this path, not moved by fear of fire and brimstone, but by love and compassion for all creation. Indwelling God, Fill us and lead us that we may find within our hearts that old, old path where the sun shines through. Not that we may set ourselves aside from a broken world, but that we may become pathfinders, setting the stepping stones for all your children to walk. Amen.
a few verses um, before speaking about the narrow gate in the Sermon on the Mount, we find Jesus teaching about asking, searching, and knocking. Ask, he says, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. This is a welcome promise that informs our mission initiative, develop disciples to serve by continually learning and growing together. Search and we will find. How should we search for the narrow gate that leads to the difficult but life-giving road? Jesus says that few people find it. By contrast, he warns that many people take the easy road through the broad gate that leads to destruction. In the past, our church interpreted this teaching in our understanding of the path of salvation, contrasting the two ways to live and journey through life. A century ago, missionary elders and 70s in our church frequently made the rounds in circuits, preaching at camping reunions and congregations, operating before the internet, before PowerPoint, and even before analog slide projectors, they made use of the multimedia available in their day. Arriving at the camp, they unrolled enormous charts painted on canvas, often as large as five feet tall by 20 feet long to teach various ideas current at the time from theories of dispensations in ecclesiastical history to ideas about the afterlife. Among the most popular subjects portrayed on the charts is a graphic depiction of the two ways, the broad way that leads downward and the narrow way that ascends upward. A century ago, these two ways were characterized very simplistically by obedience or disobedience to scriptural commandments. That is, the particular traditions or conventions taught by our church. In this understanding, the fruit of the Spirit marking the narrow way included charity, hope, faith, repentance, along with baptism, the laying on of hands, and stewardship. By contrast, the broad way, the works of the flesh, uh, included signposts that were marked lying, deception, card playing, dancing, revelry, and murder. Over the generations, we have gained perspective. Today, we see that our past focus on pastimes, like card playing and dancing, were extremely culturally specific. And in retrospect, our misplaced obsessions distracted us from perceiving real sin among us, including critically important sins like sexism and other forms of bigotry, which the church of the time promoted. Having pulled away from interpretations embedded in the two ways preaching chart, how should we better understand Jesus' teaching today? We go now to Central Lake, Michigan, where Pamela Luce offers her reflections on the path of the disciple, on seeking and on finding. I was talking with a friend, an indigenous medicine woman, sitting by a river some years ago. I had been seeking. I was seeking healing of deep childhood traumas and losses. 
She appeared in my life, of course, at just the right time. We walked through life together for a while. We were sitting there by the flowing river after many adventures in healing. I felt able once again to breathe and to open to the larger world, freed of so much of the pain and shame and confusion I had been carrying. So instead of pain and healing, that day we talked about spirals. I had shown her a picture of the Community of Christ Temple. We talked of how the spiral is a sacred pattern repeated in the earth, in the water, in the air, in the cosmos, in plants, rocks, creatures, and galaxies. We talked of the great spiral, the one where the Holy One creates us, and then we move outward and away from Creator in a great spiral path. And then the return again to the creator on a spiral path inward until we are one again. It is an individual and a collective journey. What moves us in that great spiral dance is that we are always seeking God, seeking home. Not all of the mysteries of God can be known, of course, for God is infinite and beyond our full comprehension. For those that search, though, there is a limitless well of unfolding knowledge and grace to be discovered. Proverbs 25.2 states, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. My brother shared with me that a minister friend once told him that God does not hide things from us. God hides things for us, for our growth, for our benefit, for the many challenges and blessings of discovery. Mystery is not meant to keep us separated from God, but to keep us seeking. There are many challenges along our individual and communal journey. Some are designed for our growth and development. Some challenges come because of things in this world that are not God-ordained. Injustice, hatred, violence, oppression, poverty, greed, war, and on. When these things happen, then pain, shame, despair, and hopelessness can set in. Then our natural seeking and longing can lead us tragically to fill in the empty spaces we feel with many things that will never fill us up, will never bring us real safety, security, love, and wholeness. Through our actions on behalf of a loving and merciful God, following Christ's example, empowered and guided by the Holy Spirit, to respond in ways that may sometimes be simple, may sometimes be complex. It may require of us courage rooted in our faith and in our compassion. We are created for each other and for this journey. Beloved, what are you seeking today? I pray God's grace upon you as you journey your spiral path. May you seek and find 
over and over again until you are home. You can and back now to Toronto, Ontario, for my favorite part of the service for of every Sunday when I get a chance to say hi to you. Oops, there you go. Welcome everyone to Beyond the Walls on this the second Sunday, April 14th of 2024. And thank you for building community from around the world when you say hi in, in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. And even I can actually see your chat on, on Twitch if you're there today. So do say hi if you're joining us on, on Twitch. Uh, welcome, everyone. I want to acknowledge this ministry that you do every Sunday. First of all, starting with our team, we have today... John helping us uh, uh, collect everyone's names, making sure I don't forget anyone because I want to say hi out loud to you. So if you haven't said hi, please do so now, especially if you're with your congregation, say hi. We have uh, Jerry helping us on Facebook and Lee helping us on YouTube. Thank you so much for your work. And we have here also Faith and we have Mark Shannon. Happy birthday, Mark. Uh, welcome also to Mary Beth Conrad, uh, and we're sending uh, our prayers for Larry, Mary Beth. Welcome Roger Dodson, Rhonda Ratliff, Mary, uh, Mary and Baba, Myrna and Bob Logan, Adam Euchre, Julie Trudel, Ginny Kuhn, also in, Spok in Spokane. Uh, we have Sally, Keith, Lisa, Ashley, Lucia, and Ava. Welcome Florin and Howard Sheehy. Welcome Lauren Simmons, Becky Savage, and Gould, David and Jackie Mueller. Lorna Webster, Wendy Robston, Karen Smith. I'm going to try something, see if, if that works. We haven't done this before. See if you can. Some of you can't, can't see the chat, so I'm just going to see. There you go. There's the chat. Welcome also to um, Karen Smith, Pam Luce, Holly and Robin Cross, Julie Edwards, Woody and Jody Wilson, Laura Carney, Gert in Belgium, Sarah Ritchie, Endless Kev in Scotland, Kathy and Noria Morota, Dick and Julie Foster, David Hinkle, Donna Barber, Dave and Vonnie Simons, Joy Mills, Tan Anderson in Singapore. Thanks so much, Tan, for your support. Uh, welcome, Judy Bellin, and uh, welcome, oops, I'm disconnected there with my camera. Let's see if I can find it again. Welcome, camera. There you go. Always trying new things. Welcome also to our, uh, I said, Carla O in PA. Welcome Tracy McDonald, Aaron Hart, James Carson, Ronald Hines, uh, David Wilson, Julie Visevsky, Jamie Carson, Contrell, Vivian Betts, uh, Donna Nicholson, Daryl Scott, uh, Georgia and Dwayne Graham. Welcome Ron Downing and the Vancouver congregation. And did I say welcome to Edmonton congregation? No. Welcome everyone in Edmonton at the congregation. Welcome also to Katie Mueller, Im Imran Makani, John and Jean Ann Maloney, Brenda Barney, Tim and San Pedro de Caboco, Mer uh, Michael Karpowitz, who helped us this week put all the videos together. And yes, he is the cameraman who walks upstairs up the stairs backwards. Welcome Esteban Lopez, Ruth uh, in Chile, hola. Welcome Ruth Armstrong, Raymond Ortiz, Channing McCauley, John Donald. Mer Thank you, John, for the new mixer board. We are gonna start using it very soon. Welcome also to Fiona Muir, Wanda Mercer, Denise and Mary Lou Pibogardis, Carlene McLean, Ron Bogart, Alan and Alicia Smith, Venice Maitland, Twi uh, Twyla Ryder, Sharon uh, and Eric Palmer Ham, Sam Lewis, Mary Walton, Fortin uh, Peger, are you in Lebanon? In, in Lebanon. Welcome, Jeannie Jacobson, Richard Simmons, Jan Darter, Nancy Burnett, uh, Alexandra Kozert, Corey T, Carla Nielsen, and the whole Nielsen uh, family in Oregon. Welcome, Kathy Baker, and Aaron Matthews, and um, is there anyone else? Uh, L. Jung, welcome. Also, Michelle Hauser, and... Uh, Damon Shewolf, Angel, Anella, Julie, welcome Parker Johnson, uh, and, and parents. Uh, DH, also welcome everyone. Um, 
I can't show you the Facebook chat, but there you are. I can see you guys. So if you haven't said hi, please do so. Thanks, everyone, for coming together as this congregation beyond the walls. And remember, your click, when you click like and when you share this video, it matters because it helps us draw the circle wide. Activating these algorithms on Facebook and YouTube is a way of inviting people to Christ. So we appreciate that you help in that mission when you click like and when you share this video and also when you share your name here, of course. So let us continue now with our service. Noel is better at this than I am, so please bear with me. And here we go, folks. Lord, lead me by your spirit into a better light. In truth and understanding. Lead Me By Your Spirit is a confession and a prayer of thanksgiving, as well as a petition to God. As we seek the narrow gate and the less trodden path, we ask for the Spirit's help in leading us into a better light so that we can grow ever more attuned with the divine light and goodness that is God's will. Pam helped us frame this process as grounded in intentional spiritual practice as we are continually seeking the source, seeking home. But she also reminded us that our journey is both individual and collective. The concluding words of the hymn we just shared ask that God grant that I in glad responding may truly find the strength to share the Christ with others. As much as we are tempted to make ourselves islands, isolating ourselves because of the fears of the many obligations and hazards that social interactions bring, humans are social beings. We are naturally happiest when we are in community. In the past, we were forced to be in community by necessity. Quarters were too cramped and all of life's activities from work to shopping to travel and entertainment involved interacting with others. Now, uh, much, perhaps all of that can be done with the touch of a button. But surveys and studies agree that this isolation in aggregate is not making us happier. Quite the opposite. We yearn 
for a community. But today, being in community requires intention. Okay, nevertheless, whether it is experienced by necessity or by intention, community is invariably attended by competing interests. For example, the uh, goal of group coherence can be at odds with the ability of individuals to express themselves. Governance is traditionally seen as a necessary evil. Churchill famously declared uh, that democracy itself is the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. For democracy carries with it the potential of a tyranny exercised by the majority to unjustly oppress minorities. This kind of oppression through unjust judgments was operative in our church in that era when we talk that, taught that black and white worldview using the two ways preaching charts. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives us a different example in the story of the woman caught in adultery. We go now to St. George, Utah, where Nancy Ross shares her interpretation of the story and sees in it a model for building common consent while recognizing the fundamental worth of all persons. Jesus is teaching people at the temple, and a group of Pharisees bring a woman before Jesus. The men say that they caught her in the act of adultery, insisting that the law of Moses says she must be stoned. Jesus does not respond and writes on the ground with his finger. Eventually, he speaks to the men, asking that the first person to throw a stone at the woman should be one who is without sin. And eventually everyone leaves, and Jesus encourages the woman on her way. The story of the woman caught in adultery is complicated by several conflicting pieces of historical information. The Pharisees brought the woman to Jesus for judgment, but did not have the authority to execute her, which is kind of what the account in John implies. Other scholars have noted that unlike stereotypes of bloodthirsty and legalistic Pharisees, Historical accounts demonstrate that first-century rabbinic courts did not favor the death penalty, even when the law allowed it. So what's going on here? The author of John does not give us much to go on, other than the woman who was caught in the act of committing adultery. But there is no man who stands accused with her. Where is he? Is her husband in the group of accusers? Is her lover in the group of accusers? We know that a rule was broken but are missing the details that explain what really happened. The accusers insist the law has been broken and allows for stoning. It does seem as though feelings of betrayal and revenge are running high. While we are missing the details of what happened, this situation sounds a lot like one that played out in a congregation not long ago. People in power called for the punishment of a woman who they believed was, in their understanding, caught in adultery, though the woman described her situation in very different terms. People in power ignored the complex and difficult situation that the woman was in. Choosing rules above all else and seeing punishment as a requirement of a situation and not just one possible outcome. It took months of folks in the congregation calling for compassion for the situation to be resolved. Eventually, those in power found space for grace and let the issue go, but some in the congregation saw this drawn-out process of threatened punishment and were deeply disturbed by it, as it caused the women and her family a lot of stress and heartache at a difficult time in their lives. In my imagination, I'm sure that the woman in John was relieved not to be stoned, but the threatened stoning must have been terrifying. And I'm sure that later she wondered if this big show of force had really been necessary. I want to come back to this idea 
that it can be difficult for groups of people to make compassionate and grace-filled decisions for the thriving of whole communities. We are often inclined to act from a place of feeling wronged and wish revenge on those we feel have wronged us or broken rules in some way. Group decisions often take their cues from such feelings. But here's what happened in John. Jesus reminded the accusers of the prevalence of sin, of their own sin, and in doing so asked them to have compassion for this woman. We do not know if it took minutes or hours of reflection for the men to find consensus and walk away, but they took Jesus's words to heart. In doing so, the Pharisees listened and truly heard the wisdom of what Jesus had to say. In the end, the Pharisees agreed with Jesus and turned away from their accusations. Instead of hearing the violence of stoning, instead of the violence of stoning, the woman left unharmed, though surely shaken. In my mind, this is an excellent example of the challenge of common consent that we must hear the very best of what those in a group have to say, recognize wisdom, and change our minds. Jesus asked us to be reminded of our own humanity and forgive others of their humanity. This is such hard work. In John, it is unclear if it takes a little while or a long while, but in either case, I am impressed. It is difficult to open our hearts to hear the wisdom of grace and compassion above our feelings of hurt and betrayal. In reading against the grain of traditional readings of the story, the Pharisees hear and respond to Jesus's challenge, as should we. The Pharisees in the story embrace grace and the worth of this woman as having greater value than rules that permit severe punishment. We should be like the Pharisees here, who set aside feelings of vengeance to accept the challenge of grace and compassion, see the path of, see the wisdom of that path, and find consensus in walking away in peace. While the metaphor of the two ways has a long history of black and white interpretation, a second deeper interpretation is equally ancient. Through this lens, the ways of the world are the default. People operate as they do by inheritance and by rote because that is what people have always done. As Socrates reportedly taught, the unexamined life is not worth living. The gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction seems to echo that philosophical insight. Know yourself. 
examine your life discern why you're doing what you're doing is the answer we're doing this because it leads to good or we're doing this out of love or is the answer we're doing this by default this questioning is at the foundation of an examined life robert frost captured that deeper sentiment in the final stanza of his poem the road not taken he wrote two roads diverge in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference the narrow gate the difficult way the road less traveled we must seek these and walk these intentionally through the spiritual process of discernment. <laughs> How do we go about this? How do we walk the path responsibly? The Gospels provide us with another example of this dichotomy in the story of Mary and Martha. Jesus and the disciples are coming to Bethany and they stay at the home of these two sisters. During the visit, Mary spends her time sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to everything he has to say. Meanwhile, her sister Martha is distracted by all the preparations necessary to host the group. She comes at last to Jesus and says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus responds, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. As we discern, we must sometimes step back and give ourselves a moment to pause, to consider what things are truly needed, what matters most. As Jesus told Martha, few things are needed, only one. We go now to Independence, Missouri, where Katie Harmon McLaughlin shares her experience and insights on the practice of discernment. To make space to dream and listen deeply as an act of prophetic discernment is not privilege. It is the necessary work of justice confronting grind culture and systems that dehumanize and oppress. Making space is an act of resistance. And in the space made in discernment, we discover our heart's deepest desire. Discernment is not boring obedience. It is a life ignited by divine love, ready to get to the deep truth of things, the heart of the matter, who you really are, what truly matters most. It's to want this God life, even when it is costly or humbling or too achingly revealing and real. How many choices are made from fear or self-preservation? What happens when we open the space to pause, to reflect just long enough to glimpse what is really real? What happens when we let God in to our lives, our plans, our concerns, and hopes? Few things are needed, only one. Discernment invites us to listen to the God in all things, revealed in many places, ways, and forms, waiting to surprise and stretch and delight and challenge. But discernment is not anything goes. 
To discern is to sift, to test, to discriminate among options. We cannot choose everything. We cannot be everything. One thing needful. This is why discernment takes a holistic approach. In Community of Christ, we take decisions through the six lenses for discovering God's will, which include reason, tradition, scripture, common consent, continuing revelation, and personal and communal experience. Beyond these six lenses, the discernment tradition also invites us to listen through nature, our own bodies, imagination, intuition, memory. We don't just assume that the first impulse we have is the way we should go or that what we read on the internet must be true. There's a gentle holding that's invited, a willingness to pause between decision and action, to seek out more information or relationship or the confirmation of the Holy Spirit in whatever we decide. We bring our decision into the width of diverse community to test out possibilities and to remember that we live interconnected lives where our decisions impact each other and creation. So discernment is freedom, listening, desire, sifting, confirming, and acting. I wonder, as you come today, how is the voice of Jesus calling your name away from the busyness and distraction of life to the simple focus of the one thing needful? What is the part of the world that is within your reach? What is that deepest desire in your heart that is seeking to come alive to contribute to God's preferred future for all creation. What do you need to hold lightly or spend more time sifting and testing to get to the wisdom you seek? Where is God in the here and now of your life? Discernment is the bridge between our contemplation and prophetic action in the world. It is the sacred space to listen deeply to God, each other, and our own souls. To get beneath the swirl and swale of all that surrounds us in these times. To discover the heart of the matter from which we are called to act. When we ground our lives in God as the source of our response to the world, we deepen our capacity to hold complexity and contradiction, to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty, and to resist the overwhelming urgencies of everything at once. We grow in our ability to sense the one thing needful to which we are called. The gift of a habitually discerning life is the deeper down peace of the Holy Spirit stoking our courage to live with integrity and faithfulness, even when life is hard. Listen, a sacred voice is calling. Can you hear? Listen deep in your own being and in the hum of the world around you. Sense that there is nowhere you can go where God is not already present. Awaken to the sacred brimming over everywhere. God is here and now. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. But the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Take 
Take a deep breath with me and let your exhalation be very slow as you relax your body. Take another deep breath in, trying to reach a little bit deeper into your lungs and breathe out slowly. Continue breathing intentionally and relaxing the body. As you do that, allow the awareness of these physical sensations to ground your mind in the present moment. We acknowledge at this moment that there is nothing wrong with being distracted. In fact, in this meditation we will pay special attention to these distractions. Focusing your awareness on your breath is like choosing the narrow gate. It is hard. Getting involved in your thoughts, revisiting the past wishing you could fix it, or simulating the future as if worrying about the things you must do would help, is the wide gate. Our minds naturally want to go through the wide gate, we all do this. Meditation is not just hard for you. It is hard for most humans. Yet, Jesus calls us today to enter through the narrow gate. What does that mean? When God began to create heaven and earth, God established two gates within your mind. 500 million years ago, God created your spinal cord. The wide gate God established when the earth was young. Your basic survival instincts, your fears and your cravings paved the easy way ahead. But later in the garden, God gave you the gift of the Spirit, blowing divine life into the dust, out of mud, God fashioned the narrow gate of your prefrontal cortex. This is a costly path of discernment that often seems at odds with your cravings and fears. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. But the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Try this for a few breaths. Breathe deeply and slowly, following your breath intentionally and carefully. Make your breath very smooth and constant. Do not hold your breath at any time. Pay special attention to the moment when your lungs are full and the moment when your lungs are empty. These are mere fractions of a second because you are making sure your breath keeps flowing at all times. Our predecessors were certain they were walking the hard path because they observed a set of rules. No drinking, no theaters, no dancing, no card playing, among others. Today we understand the path.
path is hard not because there are rules, but because it requires our discernment, the use of the highest gift that God has given to humankind. Holy Wisdom The narrow gate, Holy Wisdom, is right there in that timeless space when you are done exhaling before you take the next breath in. Can you find the narrow gate? Can you find holy wisdom? Once you've found it, can you stay on that hard path and find it on your next breath? How long can you stay on the hard path without falling into the broad way? Each time a thought, a physical sensation or a noise pulls your attention away from your intention, you enter the wide gate. When you become aware of this, do not be harsh on yourself. It is not game over, on the contrary, blessed are you, because you have become aware of this. It is not your place to be judgmental, but simply to ask for grace and guidance and it will be given to you. And then, once again, find the narrow gate. Find holy wisdom. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it but the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Go forth once more with the promise of Jesus given in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. 
and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Amen. So if you're here in the regular edition, we invite you to enjoy the postlude. We won't be chatting with our ministers this week, um, but if you're here with the late edition, stay tuned. You'll be able to chat with Noel. Welcome everyone once again, and uh, thank you for sharing this uh, special moment of fellowship, of worship, of spirituality, uh, of learning as well together uh, today. And once again, I'm going to try to show for you uh, this. Uh, this where, where is my my camera here? Let's see. Oh, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm trying to do. New things that we have here. There you go, so that everyone can see what's happening on, on YouTube. Because uh, really, I want to appreciate, I, I just really want to just bring forward uh, my appreciation for the ministry that you do every week when uh, you share uh, your name, your location, when you let us know that the family is there, this is what really builds the community. And it's 
the reason why we have this community today. So thank you so much. Uh, just want to remind you uh, that uh, we will uh, be having a lecture this Tuesday uh, at 7 p.m. as usual. We, we had to skip last week. Uh, uh, we are having our meditations every morning this week. Uh, I believe that we have a special event coming up. Uh, you can find out more uh, on late edition. Noel is planning a, a Zoom gathering for everyone to just keep that chat that we have here uh, on the chat on YouTube, the chat that we have on Discord, that, to bring it a little bit more to, to video so that we can see our faces. Um, Thank you, Jamie. I will post that as a, a as a standalone video, Jamie. I know I still owe you that that video of the, the the walking meditation in the snow. I need to find it, but I will post it. It's it's great to be with you. Hello to all those who I missed in the during the global welcome. I see Roman. I see uh, who's who else? Timothy. Welcome, Timothy. I see Mary Welton. I didn't say your name, Mary. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you once again. Thank you and have a wonderful uh, rest of your Sunday.